Hello viewers, welcome back to yet another episode on overambitious albums. Now, I know I promised you that the next episode would be an 80s album, and it would be the king of all 80s albums. It would wrap up this whole series. Well, I may have bit off more than I could chew, and frankly, I need more time. And so, in order to plug the gap and to satiate your inexhaustible appetite, probably not, for more content from me, I've decided to do a special bonus review for an album that I wasn't actually originally going to tackle in this series. And as you can probably guess, it's an album that I like. So today, we're going to talk about The Soft Machine. Soft Machine are one of the oldest bands considered prog, having first risen to prominence during the psychedelic days of swinging London when they were considered suitable competition for Sid Barrett era Pink Floyd. And in fact, the band even featured on Barrett's first solo album in 1970. Now, the early Soft Machine was essentially a psychedelic rock band, albeit one with a heavy jazz influence. But this began to change on the band's second album, as they began incorporating more and more elements of the developing genre that was jazz fusion. And this trend culminated in the third Soft Machine album, released in June of 1970, and simply titled Third. So it turns out Yes weren't the only people to make a double album with only four songs on it. And in stark contrast to Tales from Topographic Oceans, and to be fair, pretty much all the other albums we've talked about in this series aside from English Settlement, Third is actually fairly well regarded by critics and fans of the Soft Machine alike. In fact, for many fans, this is the last great Soft Machine album. An opinion that I agree and disagree with, which we will discuss further at the end of the episode. For now, get your tea and lysergic acid ready, because we're going to review some Soft Machine. Foreshadowing a trait of many of the tracks on this album, the first five or so minutes of facelift are not particularly engaging upon first listen, although they do grow on you. Essentially, it's several minutes of not particularly memorable keyboard noodlings, before changing slightly and becoming considerably more aggressive. In a driving, sax-heavy section that has always sort of reminded me of the mid-section of King Crimson's 21st Century Schizoid Man. But let's be honest now, that was just an excuse for me to be able to play that clip. The track continues in this vein for several minutes before abruptly stopping and moving into a much more subdued, flute-heavy passage that reminds me quite a bit of Caravan or maybe even some of the instrumental stuff in early Jethro Tull, which eventually gives way to a small, effects-laden reprise of the main theme, which concludes this song and the entire first side of the album. Slightly All the Time is great, but it's also where my review starts to run into difficulties, because the song is jazz. Pure, straightforward jazz. Electrified jazz, but jazz nonetheless. And while I love the genre to pieces, in all seriousness, jazz is probably my second favorite genre of music, I have never been able to figure out what to say about it. You put a jazz track in front of me, even one that I like, and all of my wordplay and wit will fail me, and I'll engage in lukewarm platitudes like saying, ooh, that bit's nice, or this is cool, I like that saxophone moment, until the song is over. And you've probably noticed that's what I've been doing over the last minute, attempting to deftly circumlocute actually talking about the song itself, which is lovely, by the way. Definitely a highlight from this album. Moon in June is very different from any of the other songs on this album. It's Robert Wyatt's only contribution to this album. He plays pretty much every instrument, and it was apparently the cause of some friction during the sessions. Like a lot of prog epics, it's basically four or five snippets that could have been spun off into their own songs surgically welded together by a few instrumental passages. There are 
are some clunky bits and moments where the vocals don't quite work, but there's also a lot of fantastic stuff in there and some really funny meta lyrics. The song does suffer a little bit, in my opinion, for lacking the sort of big, cathartic, crowd-pleasing conclusion that many other prog epics include. It's a great song nonetheless, not to mention the fact that it would be the last Soft Machine song to ever include vocals. Our Bloody Rages, much like Facelift, is not horrifically interesting at the beginning. The looped backwards keyboards are cool, but they go on for almost five minutes. And it's only when the piano comes in and the band starts playing this awesome jazz fusion jam over the top of it that I really start to get interested in the song. In fact, I might even say that this passage right here is probably my favorite thing on the entire album. Everything about this particular section just screams awesome. The keyboards, the bass, the drums, the horns, it's all perfect. However, nothing can last forever, and so just as the piece is building to a fever pitch of intensity, it abruptly ends. And it fades into a brief reprise of the initial backwards keyboards from the beginning of the song before segueing into a very atmospheric, moody, solo, jazzy bit that itself goes on for about four to five minutes, before we eventually get this cool reprise of that awesome theme that I loved from the middle of the song. Much like Moon and June, it ends somewhat anticlimactically with what I think is meant to be a variation on the backwards keyboards from the beginning of the song, but I'm not really sure. This album is just awesome. The genre experimentation on here works perfectly. At least on this album, Soft Machine took to jazz fusion like a fish to water. And the one track on here that's more rock is great as well. Moon and June is a fantastic farewell to the style of the first and second Soft Machine albums. And much like English Settlement was a transitional album between the two eras of XTC, Third is very much the transitional album between those two eras of Soft Machine. Third is the bridge between a jazz-influenced psychedelic band and a straightforward jazz fusion band. And as such, on some level, it's better than both. Although, unlike that XTC album, I'm not willing to say that this is the best Soft Machine album. I go back and forth on what the best Soft Machine album is. Some days I think it's the first album, some days I think it's the second album, some days I think it's the third album. Which brings us to what I alluded to at the beginning of this review. The fact that for many people, third is the last great Soft Machine album. I sort of agree. To be honest with you, Soft Machine really lost something after this album, and a lot of that was because Robert Wyatt left the band, and he took that distinctly English psychedelic whimsy with him. And the later Soft Machine albums are not bad at all. In fact, a lot of them are great. It's just that they're very, very much straight-ahead jazz fusion of the type that you could get better from groups like Weather Report or the Mahavishnu Orchestra, or even Frank Zappa to some extent. And the, the band just lost so much of what made it amazing to begin with. Those records are devoid of the wit and charm and the goofiness that made the first three Soft Machine albums some of the greatest records of the psychedelic and early progressive era. Combining the best of both eras of Soft Machine, Third is an amazing album, and honestly, 
should be picked up by anyone who's a fan of jazz fusion or progressive rock. And really, while I'm at it, I want to extend that to the first three Soft Machine albums as a whole. If you're a fan of psychedelic rock, if you're a fan of progressive rock, if you're a fan of jazz fusion, if you're a fan of just English whimsy and goofiness, check out the first three Soft Machine albums.